The reason why we are here is because any strategy development process or policy formulation process has to be as participatory as possible. You are aware, as I do, that in the process of developing the MTP4, there was stakeholder engagement. And the rationale for that was to enable the integral stakeholder segments to input into that process. One critical success factor in policy development is to bring on board all the integral stakeholders from the very beginning so that they input into the process, they understand the process, and then eventually at the tail end, they own the process. Most specifically, because now the MTP4 is ready, we are here for purposes of sensitization on the MTP4 so that you own the final product with the net effect that the same will facilitate successful implementation. You cannot implement any policy document or strategy document if the people don't understand what is in it. Or integral stakeholders do not understand what is entailed therein. And subsequent to the same, we expect that once you understand, you will be also our ambassadors as national government, as the county government, in dissemination to the wider public what is entailed in the MTP4 with specific emphasis with specific emphasis on pertinent projects and programs which are relevant to Homer Bay as a county. Now, you are aware that as at 2002, our overall development agenda as a country was pegged on the economic recovery strategy for wealth creation. And with the ERS having lived its full life as at 2007, it was then deemed imperative that we develop a new development blueprint, the Vision 2030, to guide the development agenda of Kenya as a country up to and including 2030. And that Vision 2030 was to be implemented in phases, five-year phases, and these are the medium-term plans. The first medium-term plan until the period 2008 to 2012, the second one 2013 to 2017, the third one 2018 to 2022, and now we are on the threshold of the fourth medium term plan covering the period 2023 to 2027. And with the expiry of MTP4, the government again, through the State Department of Planning, will come up with a new development framework, a new development blueprint to guide the country moving forward. Now, the other issue that we need to understand is that as we speak today, I, our overall development agenda is anchored on the bottom-up economic transformation agenda blueprint. That is the overall policy framework on the basis of which all development initiatives within the country is domiciled. And the development of this bottom-up economic transformation agenda was again a participatory process. A participatory process. The Kenya Kwanzaa team, which was led by His Excellency the President, who was then a presidential candidate, held forums, bottom-up economic forums in all the counties in the country, seeking the views of the people. And the rationale or justification for this was to integrate the fundamental challenges facing the common Mwanainchi in development of the new economic development agenda and blueprint. So it was a radical paradigm shift as opposed to top-down approach of development framework that has traditionally been the case since independence, we adapted a paradigm shift to go for bottom-up economic development approach so that the views of the people is what informs the development agenda of various parts of the country. 
And in the wisdom of the authors of the blueprint at that point in time, this then would facilitate both inclusivity and equitability in allocation of resources on one hand, and on the other, also ensure that the development programs and activities which are entailed in our economic blueprint are responsive to the fundamental challenges facing the common monarchy in all parts of the country. The other issue I want to talk about is alignment. You cannot develop any policy document or by extension strategy document in a vacuum. So in the process of developing the MTP4, there was effective alignment at all levels. Starting with alignment to the bottom-up economic transformation agenda, within which we have got five thematic areas, agriculture being one, the other one being universal health coverage, the third one being small and medium enterprises, then housing, and finally, the digital superhighway and the creative economy. So MTP4 is effectively aligned to the better. What does this alignment mean? This alignment means that if you look at the MTP4, you will find entailed therein specific programs that would help us deliver the thematic areas of the bottom-up economic transformation agenda. So there are specific programs relevant to agriculture, there are specific programs relevant to affordable housing, specific programs relevant to small and medium enterprises, universal health coverage, and the same for the digital superhighway and the creative economy. But that is at macro level. Again, because Kenya cannot operate in a vacuum, you'll realize that both MTP4 and better are also subsequently effectively aligned to our international and regional level and even global level planning framework. So those policy documents are effectively aligned to the East Africa Community Vision 2050, the Africa Union's Agenda 2063, and also the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Again, within the same realm of alignment, we are aware that the development programs for specific counties, Homer Bay inclusive, are entailed in the county integrated development plans. That CIDP is again effectively aligned to both the MTP4 and the BETA. And that has aptly been espoused here in the presentation. The rationale for this is that as much as our 2010 constitutional dispensation stipulates that the two levels of government are independent of each other, they are in equal measure in equal measure, collaborative with each other and complementary to each other. There is no single development program that the national government is going to undertake that will not be rolled out in a given county. And that, therefore, is a justification for the complementarity in the operations between the national government and the county government. And this is what the president has been preaching about, that we have to work as national government with the county governments while in the same vein recognizing that the two levels of government are independent of each other but complementary to each other. Now that we are here at the point of dissemination on MTP4, as integral stakeholders from Homer Bay County, you need to understand two things. One, the programs which are there in the MTP4, which are relevant to Homer Bay County, informed by the comparative advantages of Homer Bay as a county. Because subsequent to this, you are the same same stakeholder segments who will help both the national government and the county governments in dissemination of the same to the wider public. What are the two levels of government doing for the people? Because as governments, we exist to serve the people. That is one. The other integral component or benefit of this sensitization is accountability by way of results. If you look at the MTP4, you will realize that there is an implementation matrix 
to the extent that for each and every program or project within the MTP4, there is very clear timelines within which the project is supposed to be implemented, clear responsibility centers, clear expected outputs, and even output indicators that will inform our performance management and evaluation framework. So you really need to be conversant with the indicators. And that is why over and above the MTP4 itself, document itself, there is a complementary document on indicators for the programs entered in the MTP4. Apart from the results matrix, uh, the implementation matrix, there is also a result matrix to the extent that for each and every pro project or program in MTP4, we have got yearly annual targets so that the sum total of our performance of targets over the five-year period will give us the expected output for each activity. It is important for you again to be conversant with what is in the implementation matrix, what is in the result matrix, so that at that point in time, at the tail end, you should be able to hold all the implementing responsibility centers to account by way of performance. You are aware that one of the challenges we are facing, we have been facing as a country, is the predatory lending rates of interest rates by financial institutions. Today, the interest rate on any loans is between 16 to 17 percent. In some instances, up to 18 percent of the amount lent. But with the Hustler Fund, there was a, a drastic reduction of the interest rate to a single digit figure of 8 percent. And the rationale for this is that we need to find ways and means of facilitating small and medium enterprises to access credit or financing for their businesses. Most of these entities do not have collateral, which is a prerequisite for advancement of loans by the banks. So in this instance, you are not required to have any collateral. Any collateral is not a prerequisite. The justification is that you must have a viable business and your performance, your business performance is what is, will enable you escalate the amount of money that you are borrowing from the Hustler Fund. And again, another integral intervention is that we are leveraging on technology to advance that Hustler Fund. You apply for it electronically, it is advanced electronically, repayment is done electronically. So you don't need to talk to any intermediaries who are going to create a necessary bottleneck between you and the fund. It is between you, your fund, and the fund itself. Prioritizing the enhancement of women enterprise fund progressively from 4.5 billion to 13.5 billion in the next three years. That enhancement would enable our women who are involved in business to access credit from the women enterprise fund. The rationale for this is that we have got a critical mass of women who are involved in itinerary trade, but they do not have access to credit. We need to support them. Personally, in my own level, one thing I've done as an appointee of the national government in Nyanza here is last year to meet with all the women groups in Nyanza, in all the counties. I had meetings with them, and I brought in government officials from the relevant government entities to sensitize them on opportunities, funding opportunities which are available within government. We had representatives of the Women Enterprise Fund, the, 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 the Hustler Fund itself. We brought in officials from Sako Society's regulatory authority to sensitize them on how to constitute themselves into circles. The net effect is that as we speak today, in each and every sub-county in Nyanza, we have now facilitated these women to constitute themselves into circle. So we have got a Homer Bay Town Women's Circle, we have got Rangwe Women's Circle, we have got Bita, South and Bita North Women's Circle, just to mention but a few. We are now on the threshold of having meetings with these circles to facilitate these women by way of seed capital. As our own personal initiatives to augment other efforts they are making to acquire funding from the national government. And this is transformational. I'll give you a hypothetical example. 
There's a women group I donated one million shillings to in Awendo last year. Today, one year down the line, that money, they have managed to multiply it up to 17 million shillings. Yeah? Personally, I may have a bias, but I'm so determined in the empowerment of women because I believe that will be the only avenue we have to lay a strong foundation for the family unit. If you empower the women, one, all families will be well fed. However small the business is, nobody will sleep hungry in any family. And two, any woman who is involved in business is ready and willing to even borrow from the circle yeah, of the women chairman to finance education of the children. So lack of school fees will also be a thing of the what? Of the past. So I'm determined to go the full hog to empower the women because the multiplier effect <laughs> is evident. I know it's also good to support the men, yes, but my problem with the men is that when you empower them, the multiplier effect is polygamy. <laughs> then, the other program is provision of 5.5 million bags of fertilizer under the subsidized fertilizer program to improve agricultural yields at affordable price of 2,500 per bag. When we came into government, a 50 kilogram bag of fertilizer was going at a market rate of 6,500. Today we have reduced that drastically to 2,500. We are now moving to the next level to ensure that the fertilizer is available in each and every sub-county so that the farmers can access it. And we are doing this deliberately and consciously as a government under the leadership of His Excellency the President because we are aware that one of the fundamental challenges we are facing as a country is the cost of living. In the presentation here, you listen to that, cost of living, yeah, eradicate hunger, and so on and so forth. 55% of the cost of living in this country emanates from the cost of food. So to address the cost of living, we must start by bringing down the cost of food. And the cost of food is a function of the cost of inputs which go into the production process, starting with fertilizer, moving to seeds, and so on and so forth. So that is the direction we are taking. If we put money in agriculture as a government, we will sort out the cost of living, we will ensure that quite a number of youth also get employment within the agriculture value chain. Digitalization of government services. When we came into government, we only had 350 services available on the e-citizen platform. As we speak today, we have managed to digitalize a whopping 16,000 962 government services which are available on the e-citizen platform. Good people. The import of this is that in the not too distant future, we will no longer have a justification to ask Kenyans to physically visit government offices to consume government services. Not at all. Kenyans should be able to consume the government services from the comfort of wherever they are, from their houses, whether you are in Kenya or you are abroad, consume the services from abroad. We have had hitherto instances where Kenyans resident abroad have to physically travel back to Kenya to acquire passports, for example, or IDs. That will now be history. They should be able to consume those services from wherever they are out there, virtually, through the e-citizen portal. The other thing that we have done in this space is we recognize that there's a challenge of affordability of the handset. Most Kenyans, as we speak, still do not have access to affordable, smart, enabled telephones. Most people are on Mlikamwiz. Again, proactively, as government, we have partnered with the private sector and we have embarked on local assembly of affordable, smart, enabled telephones. That assembly plant, as we speak today, has already managed to churn out about 500,000 handsets, and 70% of that has already been uptaken by Kenyans. They are going, those phones, the neon phone, if you go to Safaricom, any Safaricom outlet or Jami Telecom outlet, you'll get those phones. They are going for $40 a 
um, at those uh, outlets. And you will be able then, because it has all the features of a smartphone, you can then use that to consume the government uh, services. 1,000 affordable housing units every year. And in Homer Bay County alone, we are talking of 120 housing units, which are already uh, about 85% complete. Formulation and implementation of a new funding model for tertiary education, that's work in progress. Recruitment of teachers, this is another major intervention. You are aware, last year there was a massive recruitment of teachers. The target is 56,000 primary and secondary school teachers to improve the national teacher-pupil ratio. Then operationalization of the Open University at Konza. This was again another pledge, and we have fulfilled this already. As at 30th October last year, His Excellency the President opened or officially inaugurated the Open University of Kenya. The meaning of Open University is that it is a university through which you can access university programs digitally or electronically or virtually. As we speak, about 2,000 Kenyans are already pursuing university education through that portal which is domiciled at our Konza Technopolis. The net effect, good people, is that if we go virtual in education, we are going to drastically facilitate reduction in the cost of education. That is one. Two, we will facilitate inclusivity. Education is the greatest equalizer we have in life. We will facilitate inclusivity. Anybody and everybody can now access university education. We have got so many bright people who have not managed to acquire university education because of affordability. I was mesmerized the other day when I came across Amatatu Tao, who was waiting for his passengers. But as he was waiting for his passengers, he was very busy on the telephone. He had logged into a class at the Open University. And that is transformational. These fellows you see on the streets, either youth driving border borders, or Matatu Tao, don't think that these people have not gone to school. They have gone to school, but it is due to failure or lack of what? Opportunities. And as opposed to return, uh, resorting to crimes, they have opted for the bare minimum that they can acquire by way of uh, economic activity. Establishment of the Social Health Insurance Act, you know about the reforms which have undertaken place in the health sector already. Within the rural areas here, we have got the Nyambuewa, the community health workers. That has also put so many of our mothers and sisters into the income bracket. But fundamentally, we want to re-engineer the entire health system so that we facilitate access to health for all Kenyans. And then two, we also want to facilitate affordability. And we are leveraging on technology to support the Ministry of Health on this. For example, just to give a hypothetical example, why should I go to the hospital here in Homa Bay? I'm asked to do a scan. If next week I'm still unwell and I'm in Kisumu, I go to New Nyanza General Hospital, I'm asked again to do a different scan, the same scan I've done in Homa Bay. And if I'm in Nairobi, the same scan is asked of me at Kenyatta National Hospital. It does not just make sense. So we are leveraging on technology to ensure that all our health records can be available electronically to facilitate interoperability of data while in the same measure operating within the confines of the Data Protection Act 2019 to ensure privacy and confidentiality of those medical records. That's what we are doing. And this again is going to facilitate drastic reduction in the cost of healthcare. During the fourth medium term plan, the government will boost production through value chain approaches. We have, you have seen the, the value chains. Leather, for example, good people. Nyanza here has got the se second highest quality of leather from our cows here. Would you believe? <coughs> that we have companies who buy a skin of a cow at 50 shillings from us. They process it, export it. From one skin, they generate three shoes. They are in Italy. 
And then in return, we import shoes from Italy. Those shoes now, we are buying them at 15,000 shillings a piece. The implication is that out of 50 shillings that we received, somebody is making 44,950 shillings. It is unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. That is why we must find ways and means of exploiting the potential that we have in this region, in the leather value chain. We used to have, long time ago, when we were young, we had in Kisumu Lake Tanners. We also had Nehru hide some skins. I don't know what happened to those entities. They all collapsed. Cotton has been aptly put here. We used to have cotton genomes all over Nyanza. Cotton was a major cash crop in Nyanza, Homa Bay inclusive. Today we do not have the cotton genomes. We must revitalize the cotton industry. Cotton was a major cash crop, both for sale and even subsistence. In fact, you may not believe it. I remember when I was in primary school, we used to walk a long distance from home to school in the morning. But because lunch hour was only one hour between one o'clock and two o'clock, we could not manage to walk back home to eat lunch and then walk back to school in time. So what we used to do is just a question of being creative. We would go out of the school and digress into the cotton farms because there wasn't too much restriction at that point in time. And then we will pluck the cotton seed and chew. And that was our lunch. Yeah? All that is today gone. Yeah? So we must revitalize cotton, tea, rice, edible oils, pyrethrum. This area has a lot of potential already. The blue economy opportunities cannot be gainsaid good people. And the government is already doing its bit, the fish landing sites all over Nyanza, starting from Usenge in uh, Siaya, there's one at Wichilum, Luanda Kotieno, Assembo Bay, Kindu Bay here, Homa Bay, all the way up to Mehu in Migori. That would be another major intervention in the marketplace because we are going to support our fishermen by way of refrigeration facilities. Minerals. If you go to Migori, we have a lot of gold at Makalda. But it is very painful that when you go to Makalda, the only performance indicator that gold has been mined in that area is the big gapping holes. Why can't we review our policies and laws to ensure that anywhere where gold or any mineral for that matter has been mined, a substantial proportion of those proceeds must go back to the people of that region. Yeah? Here in Homa Bay, are you aware that we have got substantial deposits of iron ore? If we exploited that, we would have a major steel industry in Homa Bay. Why must we go and buy from the steel factories in Kisumu or anywhere else for that matter? It just beats logic. It's a question of thinking straight and exploiting that opportunity so that we have got a steel manufacturing factory here in Eldorado. Forestry. The county commissioner will tell you we have been facing a lot of challenges with floods in the recent past. To the extent that quite a number of people have been rendered homeless, others are now relying on support from both the government and other stakeholders for subsistence livelihood. But that is a challenge, yes. But within this range, we also have an opportunity, good people, to plant trees. Let us go out and plant trees. The national government has got the 15 billion shilling tree program, but in our own individual capacities, let us also plant trees. Trees is today big business. Through carbon credit, you'll get money. Trees will stop soil erosion. Trees will also facilitate sustainability in rainfall. So let us do our bit at household level to plant trees. I started planting trees in the year 2007. As we speak, I'm at 1.2 million trees. And in my view, that is my retirement package. I don't need to do anything else. I can survive on those trees in old age, to go to hospital when I'm sick, or to eat what I want. So please, good people, plant trees. Then construction and building materials. Now, on the housing program, the objective of government is not so much 
the houses themselves, but also to create jobs for the youth along the value chain on one hand, but on the other hand, create market for our own products. Why should we, for example, go and buy doors made in Nairobi and made by foreign companies? Why do we have got our good youth here who can make doors for those houses? Why must we buy windows, steel windows, and doors from elsewhere? We have got our own youth here who can do that. We have our own plumbers, we have got our own electricians. So the housing program is going to get a number of jobs for the youth. The special economic zones and the county aggregated and industrial parks, that again is another major plank in the better plan and the national government is working in cohorts with the county government in that regard. Financial inclusion, inclusivity and access to credit. The Hustler Fund is just one of the interventions. We also have those other funds that we have talked about. To enhance efficiency and enhance mobility, the plan entails substantial investment in infrastructure development. You have listened to the road network here, the one in Mufangano, yeah? uh, the other one uh, in, uh, from Sindo to Magunga, just to mention but a few. Within this infrastructure space, the expansion of this airstrip in Homabe is also in plan.